Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Kang. I am one of the administrators here at Wood Middle School, and it is my pleasure to be joining you today to read Chapter 21 out of Jason Reynolds and Dr. Abram Kendi's book, Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You. Let's get started. Section 5. 1963 to today. Chapter 21, When Death Comes. Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson, Carol Denise. Hello, Wood Middle School. My name is Dr. Kang. I am the seventh grade assistant principal, and it is my pleasure to be here with you today to read to you chapter 21 out of Jason Reynolds and Ibram Kendi's. Good afternoon, Mustangs. My name is Dr. Kang. I am one of the assistant principals here at Wood Middle School. And it is my pleasure to be with you here today to read chapter 21 out of Jason Reynolds and Dr. Ibram Kendi's book, Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You. All right, let's get started. Section 5, 1963 to today. Chapter 21, When Death Comes. Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson, Carol Denise McNair. Addie Mae Collins. These were the names of four girls killed in a church bombing. It's September 16, 1963, the Herald Tribune. Angela Davis was a college student, a junior at Brandeis University, where she read these names in the newspaper, four girls killed in Birmingham, Alabama. Angela Davis was from Birmingham. She knew these names. Her mother, Sally Ake, had taught Carol Denise in the first grade. The Robertson and Davis families had been close friends for as long as she could remember. The Wesleys lived around the block in the hilly Birmingham neighborhood where Angela grew up. Angela's mother wasn't deterred by the bombings. It was a frightening and painful moment, but the Davises were active, and by active, I mean activists. Sally Davis had been a leader in the Southern Negro Youth Congress, an anti-racist organization that protested racial and economic disparities. On Dynamite Hill, where Angela Davis grew up, Sally and her husband trained their daughter to be an anti-racist. And so most of her childhood was spent wrestling with poverty, with the poverty and racism around her. Why didn't her classmates have certain things? Why were they hungry? Why weren't they able to eat in school? She even decided early on that she would never, despite the pressure, desire to be white. Good afternoon, Mustangs. My name is Dr. Kang, and I am the seventh grade assistant principal here at Wood Middle School. And it is my pleasure to join you today to read chapter 21 of Jason Reynolds and Dr. Ibram Kendi's book, Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You, which we've been reading throughout this year. So let's get started. Section five. 1963 to today. Chapter 21, When Death Comes. Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson, Carol Denise McNair, Addie Mae Collins. These were the names of four girls killed in a church bombing. It's September 16th, 1963, the Herald Tribune. Angela Davis was a college student, a junior at Brandeis University, where she read these names in the newspaper, four girls killed in Birmingham, Alabama. Angela Davis was from Birmingham. She knew these names. Her mother, Sally, had taught Carol Denise in the first grade. 
the Robertson and Davis families had been close friends for as long as she could remember. The Wesleys lived around the block in the hilly Birmingham neighborhood where Angela grew up. Angela's mother wasn't deterred by the bombings. It was a frightening and painful moment, but the Davises were active. And by active, I mean activists. Sally Davis had been a leader in the Southern Negro Youth Congress, an anti-racist organization that protested racial and economic disparities. On Dynamite Hill, where Angela Davis grew up, Sally and her husband trained their daughter to be an anti-racist. And so most of her childhood was spent wrestling with the poverty and racism around her. Why didn't her classmates have certain things? Why were they hungry? Why weren't they able to eat in school? She even decided early on that she would never, despite the pressure, desire to be white. She fought and spoke out all the way up until she got to college at Brandeis, a predominantly white institution, where she didn't agree with the kind of activism going on. An activism laid out by white people who couldn't see that they weren't the standard. But she found her outlets. She found a place to put her activist energy. James Baldwin, one of Davis's favorite authors, came to Brandeis in 1962, just before the release of his activist manifesto, The Fire Next Time. Baldwin crafted a collection of essays that encapsulated the black experience with racism. The book contains a letter to his nephew, warning him of oppression coming his way, and another letter addressing the centennial celebration of the Emancipation Proclamation, in which he charges both black and white Americans to attack the nasty legacy of racism. It's a macro and micro examination of the American race machine and ultimately a master class in anti-racism. Malcolm X also came, and though Davis didn't agree with his religious learnings, she really fell in line with his political ideas. She was fascinated by the way he explained the racism black people had internalized an inferiority complex forced on them by white supremacy. But during Davis's junior year while studying abroad in France, she was emotionally transported home when she read the four names in the Tribune. Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson, Carol Denise McNair, Addie Mae Collins. Back to Dynamite Hill. Davis didn't see this moment as a special event, a one-off incident, no. She had grown up fully aware of American racism and its deadly potential. All she could do was swallow it and use it as fuel to keep fighting. President John F. Kennedy, on the other hand, had to figure out how to fix it. Well, there was no fixing it, but at least he had to do something to snuff out what could become a complete explosion on Dynamite Hill. He launched an investigation, which by the way, caused his approval ratings to drop. Can you believe that? Four children were killed, bombed, and because the president tried to go get to the bottom of it, his Southern constituents and supporters were actually upset. Kennedy tried to rebound, tried to boost his ratings back up in Dallas two months later. He never made it back to the White House. Two days after Kennedy's burial, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who was now president, proclaimed that the civil rights bill that Kennedy had been working on would be passed. But what did that mean? On paper, it would mean that discrimination on the basis of race was illegal. But what it actually meant was that white people, even those in favor of it in theory, could then argue that everything was now fine. That black people should stop crying and fighting and get over everything because now things were equal. It meant they'd argue what they'd been arguing that black people's circumstances are caused solely by themselves. And if they just worked harder and got educations, they'd succeed. It meant they'd completely ignore the hundreds of years of head starts white people had in America. And the worst part, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 would have caused white people to rethink white seniority and superiority. And instead of dealing with it, they turn it on its head, flip it around, to the old okie doke and claim that they were now the victims, that they were being treated unfairly, unjustly. So even though the act was supposed to outlaw discrimination, it ended up causing a backlash of more racist ideas. Nonetheless, 
the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was the first important civil rights legislation since the Civil Rights Act of 1875. Hours after President Johnson signed it into law on July 2nd, 1964, he hit the TV screen to play up the whole American ideal of freedom. His appearance on television may as well have been a sitcom, a show fully cast with the best actors, complete with smiling faces and a laugh track. And Black Americans, at least those who'd seen the show before, looked on, entertained, but fully aware, fully aware it was all scripted. And cut. Malcolm X, full of distrust for America, spoke out not against the bill, but about the likelihood of its actually ever being enforced. Who was going to make sure the laws would be followed if the law, lawmakers, and law enforcers were all white and racist? Angela Davis felt the same way, and Angela and Malcolm weren't wrong. This was a political play. President Johnson knew that since he'd made it about Kennedy, this bill wouldn't hurt his position as president or his potential to get reelected. At least, that's what he thought. But George Wallace, the governor of Alabama, an ultimate racist, threw a major wrench in Johnson's reelection plans. Wallace had taken a public stand for segregation the year before and received 100,000 letters of support, mostly from Northerners. Wait, what? Yep, Northerners, sending in letters in support of Wallace's stance for segregation. This proved painfully that everyone, the North and the South, hated Black people. Barry Goldwater, a senator from Arizona, was also running. Goldwater was ushering in a new kind of conservatism. His platform was that government assistance, which white people had been receiving for a long time, was bad for human beings. That it turned people into animals. Of course, this racist epiphany hit Goldwater once black people started receiving government assistance too. Funny how that happened, yet not funny at all. It's like someone telling you they hate your shoes, and then a week later, once they've put you down and made you feel insecure, they start wearing them. This strange game of whatever is good for the goose, not being good for the gander. A gander is a male goose, but for this example, a gander is a whole bunch of black people. But Goldwater, despite the support he had from well-to-do whites, didn't worry Johnson either. Johnson was concerned about the black political movements like the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee who weren't satisfied with what Johnson was doing for them. The Northern activists had been dealing with and protesting police brutality and exploitation. The Southern activists had survived and were continuing to survive the Klan. And what did Johnson offer them? What leverage did he grant the SNCC and the MFDP? Two seats at the Democratic National Convention, which was basically nothing. No power. And without power, all the protesting in the world meant nothing. The shift went from fighting for civil rights to fighting for freedom. The difference between the two is simple. One implies a fight for fairness. The other, a right to live. Malcolm X's empowerment philosophy of Black national and international unity, self-determination, self-defense, and cultural pride started to sound like music to the ears of the SNCC youth. At the end of 1964, Malcolm X returned from an extended trip to Africa, a growing band of SNCC admirers and a growing band of enemies. Unfortunately, a few months later, February 21, 1965, at a Harlem rally, Malcolm would be gunned down by those enemies. When James Baldwin heard the news in London, he was devastated. When Dr. Martin Luther King heard the news in Selma, Alabama, he was calm, reflective, acknowledged that, though they didn't always agree on methods, much like Du Bois and Washington, and Du Bois and Garvey, they wanted the same thing. Malcolm X's death rocked the black anti-racist followers, especially the ones populating urban environments. He'd instilled a sense of pride, a sense of intellectual prowess, a, se a sense of self into many. 
He made street guys feel that they had a place in the movement. He gave athletes like Muhammad Ali a higher purpose than boxing. He debated and deconstructed racism with a fearlessness many people had never seen. And his ideas evolved into a more inclusive constitution just before the end of his life. The media, however, well, the media did what the media had been doing for decades, centuries. They spun his entire life into a boogeyman tale devoid of context. Malcolm X's life was strangely and pitifully wasted, read a New York Times editorial. But anti-racists honored him and would have something to hold on to forever to reference his ideas. Alex Haley had been working with Malcolm on his autobiography and the book would be published after his death. His ideological transformation from assimilationist to anti-white separatist to anti-racist inspired millions. He argued that though white people weren't born racist, America was built to make them that way. And that if they wanted to fight against it, they had to address it with other racist white people around them. He critiqued black assimilationists, called them puppets, especially the leaders who had exploited their own people to climb the white ladder. Malcolm X stamped that he was for truth, not hate, truth and truth alone, no matter where it was coming from. His autobiography would become anti-racist scripture. It would become one of the most important books in American history. President Johnson, still dealing with the hate from white people and the distrust from black people around the Civil Rights Act, decides to go even further than that bill, decides to double down, dig his heels into the anti-racist mud. After the Civil Rights Act came the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and though it would cause what every bit of progress caused, white rage and resistance, the Voting Rights Act would become the most effective piece of anti-racist legislation ever passed by Congress of the United States of America. Hope you enjoyed chapter 21 from the book Stamped by Jason Reynolds and Dr. Abram Kendi. Stay tuned for discussion topics from your teachers. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of the day.